Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, another Friday webinar with the Land App. Um, for those that haven't met me, I'm Dan, and I'll be leading the session today, um, talking about everything around the England Woodland Creation Offer and the various tools that we've released in partnership with the Forestry Commission. A bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, as this is a webinar, your camera and microphone will be turned off for the duration. But of course, that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. The Q&A function on Zoom is live and my colleague Kathy will be fielding questions throughout and we will have a bit of a session at the end to answer them. Um, I will stay around for five or ten minutes after the webinar finishes. So if anyone wants to stay and have a more informal chat, um, would, would be delighted to speak. Um, and the session is being recorded uh, and we'll hopefully get it on our YouTube channel early next week. Finally, we've got a couple of questions that will um, pop up when you leave the webinar. Just a bit of a survey that both helps us at the Land App, but also our partners over at the Forestry Commission. So please do find two minutes just to answer those questions. They're mostly yes and no questions, but it helps just indicate our next steps. So the agenda today is, um, once I finish the introductions, we're going to give a bit of an overview on the partnership. So um, both with the Forestry Commission and the work we've been doing with the Woodland Carbon Code. I'm then going to spend about half an hour 35 minutes demonstrating three new tools that are within the, the land app that supports uh, the England Woodland creation. There's the checker tool itself, which is just identifying eligible land and also the potential both financially and carbon potential. And then we're going to demonstrate our new woodland creation template that we've released as part of this um, process, just how you can use the template um, to draw and create woodland creation plans. Um, and then finally, I'm going to show the England Woodland Creation Validator, which is uh, a similar tool to the checker, but it just makes sure that the woodland creation plan that you've created is um, still within the bounds of um, the UCO scheme. Um, also, uh, we've got a quick conversation with Chris Waterfield, who is uh, joining us as a panellist um, um, from the Forestry Commission, where we'll be talking a bit about how the Forestry Commission see the tool benefiting their outcomes. Um, both from a personal and a, a wider strategic level as well. We've then got 10 minutes at the end for Q&A, so please do use that Q&A function um, throughout the, the session if there's anything that needs clarification. We will be uploading our uh, recording to YouTube, as I mentioned, so we're youtube.com slash at land app. On there, there's a whole load of other webinars that we've run, so if you are interested in learning more, please do check out the, uh, the YouTube channel and hopefully that will make your life a bit easier. So what have we built in terms of our work with the Forestry Commission? Um, we've, we've really trying to help speed up both the education of people on the England Woodland Creation Scheme, but also to um, fully uh, support you in designing good schemes that are underpinned by good data to help ensure that the quality of the applications that are going to the Forestry Commission are as high as they possibly can be. Uh, UCO itself and the tool we've been working on was actually funded through the, the marketing um, department of the Forestry Commission. Um, uh, the, the UCO scheme is a generous one, but they're still seeing um, you know, opportunity for more take up across, across England from both the states, holdings and farm, farmland alike. And the more that we can do as a tool to educate people on the potential of the scheme, the more likelihood we hope that the uh, applications will increase. The four stages we're really, really focusing on today are first the check stage. So I'm going to be demonstrating a bit later the ability for you to take a single business identifier number and check the eligibility of that holding against um, the Forestry Commission's constraints. So identifying where you absolutely just can't plant woodland or it's not recommended to plant woodland but also on the flip side to identify which of those eligible sites are the highest value. And that high value is looking at scoring those woodlands based on their location within the landscape. What I really love about that scheme is that it's really helping identify right woodland, right place, and trying to promote the additional benefits that you get from a woodland rather than just perhaps focusing on a single outcome. And those outcomes can be for biodiversity, they can be for flooding, they can be for you know, social access as well. So we're trying to make it very easy for you to identify which of those woodland blocks meets more objectives and thus will pay you more. 
We then want to help you plan. You know, there's a lot of eligible land. We do not expect or do not want, you know, every part of farmland here to be turned into woodland. That's definitely not the plan. What we want is strategic positioning of woodland to help us meet our goals while also promoting food production, farm resilience, etc. And so we want to provide you with the tools to be able to plan your woodland creation using our easy to use mapping interface that meets your business requirements. Um, so we make it very easy for you to try to pick from the list of uh, eligible options to design a plan that actually works for you. On top of that location of the woodland, we of course want you to plan some of the additional works that come with building a woodland. For example, there's a lot of capital items within the UCO scheme that allows you to um, apply for uh, funding to support, so that could be deer fencing and deer control, that could be gates and access, et cetera, et cetera. Then we want to finally, once you've done your plan, help you validate. So it, we want to ensure that the plan that you've created is still within the confines of that original checker. And so I'm just going to demonstrate a toolbox that allows you to very quickly and simply validate your plan and ensure that that design is still um, eligible for UCO. And then coming soon is just a little teaser really is we obviously want you to apply and you can take those designs to apply. But what we have built behind the scenes is a way of just auto populating the UCO application form. So the annex with about 60% of the answers, you know, we can't fill it all, but what we're really trying to do is save you time, particularly our professional network as well. Um, so that auto populator is still in testing phase, but we're hopefully um, be getting that out soon. Um, just to try and pre-populate many of those rows of data, particularly around the, the location of, of the intervention and the size of the interventions as well. So before I demo the tool, just to make people aware of the constraints, so the, the Forestry Commission have designed, defined five data layers that will define that woodland can't be planted there. At the moment, Forestry Commission do not um, uh, want to promote woodland planting on grade one or grade two agricultural land. Neither on triple SIs, priority habitats, scheduled monuments with a 30 metre buffer around those scheduled monuments and, of course, peatland as well. So those five layers are automatically aggregated and used as a constraint, as a hard no, we're not going to be promoting woodland on those areas. And um, that always handled automatically behind the scenes as part of this um, model. Of course, if other data layers come through, we will be adding those as and when they are needed as well. But for the moment, those are the five that are being um, triggered, which means if you are running the tool and you're not getting any eligibility, just consider our, our, is your land intersecting one of those five data sets. Alongside the constraints, we do also model on your behalf Woodland Carbon Code estimates, and these are very much there to give you an indication of the potential of the carbon that you could um, sequester over 100 years. And what it does in practice is it takes each one of those woodland blocks that could be planted and runs it against the um, environmental site classification tool from Forestry Commission and the Woodland Carbon Code to give an estimation. And it's very much you know, a ballpark figure. It's not there to tell you exactly how many carbon units you could go sell tomorrow, but it gives you an indication, am I at 50 or am I at 400? Um, uh, carbon units, for example. The way it's calculated is it, it gives an estimated total carbon CO2 equivalent um, per hectare and then times is that number by the total hectares of the woodland. Um, but if you want to learn more, please do go on the uh, Woodland Carbon Code website and also the guidance within Land App should help you explain a bit more. And of course, we've got Chris on the call who I will be speaking about this a bit later on as well. So I'm going to now switch over to a live demo. Um, so, and I'm gonna assume for now that everyone on the call um, has managed to get an account on Land App. If you haven't, as a note, everything I'm demoing today is available for free. You can find us at thelandapp.com and you can sign up for free using the sign up button at the top right hand side of the screen. If you are interested in more about what we do, please do go to our website. Uh, thelandup.com. We've got case studies, we've got blogs, we've got updates, we've got functions, etc. that you can read about. Once you've created an account, you'll be dropped on what's known as the maps dashboard. Um, and it's within this maps page that as you build your, your portfolio of clients, or if you're a farm, build your, your portfolio of different holdings, um, each of these indicate a separate one. So each of these little map thumbnails represent a new map. I'm going to start by creating a new map. And this can be my demo for UCO. 
And I can add a tag if I'm in a subscription as well to kind of help me filter my plans. And I hit create an empty map. What this then does is that then drops me as usual on an interactive base map that I can interact with my mouse. I can zoom in and I can zoom out. For the demonstration, I'm gonna probably be most of the time on an ordnance survey backcloth. So this grayscale one, but I might be flicking over to my Bing imagery as well, um, just for checking uh, when I'm doing my design a bit later on. So the first thing we always recommend with the land app is just by downloading your field path or data. Obviously everyone on this call will hopefully have a single business identifier number. As a note, at the moment, the tool is only available to those with a single business identifier because the, the scheme itself is only available to England Woodland. So I would always recommend coming into the land app and importing the field boundaries from the Rural Payments Agency just to act as an area of interest. And you do that by hitting new, import data, going into the import from Rural Payments Agency button, and then typing in your nine digit single business identifier number. From here, you can download a number of different data sets. But for now, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna download land covers because that gives me a really nice overview of the existing um, habitats that are on the ground, where there's grassland, where there's existing woodland, et cetera. And then I'm gonna hit next. And because I'm working with the Rural Payments Agency, the, the easiest um, data language to bring it in is the basic payment scheme. And that's simply because the land app will automatically then use that as a land cover map. I can then name my plan, which I'm gonna call it land cover with my FBI number and hit finish. And all that does is that sends a request to the Rural Payments Agency and brings down my land cover map to represent my area of interest. From here then, I can obviously see visually where the different habitats are. So I've got my grassland in light green. I've got my existing woodland in a dark green. And I've also got arable areas that are highlighted with a red boundary um, with no, no code associated to them yet, but I can easily add arable codes to them by selecting them and choosing a type of code, for example. And I'm not gonna do that all, but you can hopefully see that adding to your land cover map is nice and easy if you need to do that. But the main thing I'm here to do is just demonstrate the three steps of that UCO tool. So the first step is I want to find out for my client in this case, or it could be my own farm, which parts of my farm are eligible. Now manually, I could obviously start doing that. So I could go into data layers and turn on those different constraints like triple SIs, like priority habitat inventory, um, um, agricultural land, classification, et cetera. But as you're building that data layer, it can be quite messy. It can be quite hard to visualize and actually quantify which parts of my farm are at least eligible for woodland. And when you add on top of that, all the different scoring layers that are being created by Forestry Commission. So these are all the different layers that show me where I'm gonna get paid more to do woodland. You can start to see how that amount of data is really quite hard to digest and interrogate to make an actionable, meaningful plan. And that's where our first tool comes in. We've built a tool with the Forestry Commission to do all of that bit for you. And you access it by hitting the new button, download data, and at the bottom of that list, there's now a UCO England Woodland Creation Offer Checker tool, and it is free. So you click on that and you're then met with this little list that takes you through the, the stages that are required to request your eligible areas, but also to request those um, areas of high value. The first thing you need to do is define your area for download. You can either choose an existing plan. So in my case, I could choose that land cover map that I've just downloaded. Or if you haven't got an existing plan, you can just create a frame, ensuring that that frame covers all of your area of interest. For those holdings that maybe have a large SBI number, so I know a couple of wildlife trusts, for example, or some of the bigger estates, you can actually use this as a way of just filtering for certain blocks of your farm as well. So if you do want to call your entire SBI number, but maybe filter it by a, a region or a block, that creative frame will allow you to very easily do that. But for the demo, I'm happy to bring in all of this um, area of interest. You then can give it a name. So I'm literally just gonna call it my farm. The land app will add UCO at the end of the name. It's just more of what the plan's gonna be called. And then you add your SBI number. When you hit download now, you'll then be given a message. And that message is saying that the data is now being triggered 
in principle, what's happening is the land app is just going back to the rural payments agency and getting the SBI number. So it's first extracting the land cover data, and then it's running it through a series of data questions based on those data layers that I just looked at to return for me some insight that will help me make an easier business decision. The process itself takes about 30 seconds. So I'm just going to wait a moment and you will receive an email um, when you've um, had a successful uh, running of the data. We are looking at, by the way, to improve our notification system in app. So at the moment, I know an email means you have to go somewhere else to check that you've received it. But at least for now, um, we within Land App um, can control uh, that email being sent. I'm just going to double check that things are running in the background. There we are, and it's come through, I hope. So I've just refreshed my screen. So that's the first thing to say for you to access this data. And if you can't see it, wait 30 seconds and refresh your screen and, and do check your um, emails if uh, you're struggling to understand whether nothing's come through. In the event where you are, say, 100% in grade one land, you are 100% within a constraint and therefore no data will be served. Yeah but you should receive an email summarizing that. So you should get an email summarizing why you haven't received any data. Now within Land App, I've gone from having just one layer, which was my land cover layer, to having four separate layers. And I'm just gonna take these each by turn to explain the difference to you. The first one, which is called all options, underscore UCO, my farm, shows every block of land that is eligible for UCO based on those five constraints that I mentioned before. So these are every part of my farm that isn't in a priority habitat, isn't a scheduled monument, isn't on peat, and isn't an existing um, priority habitat or woodland. And so there has been blocks of land that you can see that have been deemed ineligible. So I know, for example, this field is actually a priority habitat grassland, so that's been excluded. And also these blocks that are grayed out in the middle are existing woodland. So we've removed those because um, we're obviously not going to want you to plant woodland on existing woodland. So these, are, these are, represent everywhere that's eligible. The reason that they're subdivided in some of these fields, um, we'll come on to in more detail in a moment, is that these two different polygons, even though they're the same field, have different um, values, or some of them might be eligible for natural colonization where others aren't. So in the instance of this block, the natural colonization uh, element, which is you can establish your woodland providing it's within 75 meters of an existing seed source. This part is 75 meters and outside it's not. So we've subdivided that field for you. And that's represented in the right hand panel by this natural colonization button. Now, although this is showing all the eligibility, what you're probably more interested in is which of my blocks are, in, are um, eligible for natural colonization and which ones are ultimately the most value uh, according to the additional contributions layer. So we, we've, instead of serving it just as one layer, we've decided to serve you those two extra layers just to give you additional insight. That first one is just everywhere that is within 75 meters of a um, existing seed source. So existing woodlands um, uh, are, are being mapped and we add a buffer to those existing woodlands to show you where those 75 meter areas are. And you can start to see which parts of the fields um, uh, are considered uh, eligible. Why, why that's important is a couple of reasons, and I might ask Chris about this in a, in a moment, is that by going through this process, although you're receiving the same uh, payment, you're not having to consider um, fully planting all the whips and all the guards. You might need to do some assisted colonization. There's obviously ways to establish the woodland, but ultimately the, the expenditure to establish that woodland is going to be lower than it would be starting in a field that you have to fully seed or fully plant yourself. So therefore, the, the value of that intrinsically is higher simply because your, your, your capital expenditure is less. On top of that, we've also then served, based on those scoring data sets, which of those woodland blocks um, overlap more of the uh, additional contributions layer. And just as a reminder, the additional contributions layer are in the right hand side. You get, can get paid for biodiversity. You can get paid for flood risk management. You can get paid for keeping rivers cool. And all of those when overlapped define which parcels are more valuable according to the um, Forestry Commission scoring. So by overlapping those and turning those on, I can see that over in the left hand side, more of my farm is within those scoring regions. And that's what this high value data layer represents. 
These represent all of the polygons of land that achieve more than 2,800 pounds additional contribution um, based on their location. So this is that mindset of thinking about right thing, right place. Where can my woodland achieve more um, for the public good and more for my farm as well? So why were these particular blocks uh, high value? So if I click on one of them, the right hand panel will tell me both the, the intrinsic value of that block, but also what um, data layers it intersected as well. The first thing is that the payment rate on the right hand side is calculated at 350 pounds per hectare per year for the first 15 years of the woodland planting. And that's known as the maintenance payment um, through the UCO scheme. And that's automatically calculated by Land App to be your annual reoccurring maintenance for the first 15 years. On top of that, you have uh, some descriptions here. So I've got a note from Land App to say certain elements of this field parcel have been removed due to a designation. Um, so I would have to look through the designation to work out exactly which one it is, but I think it's because there's a priority habitat woodland within the same parcel. Below that description, I also get the total contribution value. So on top of that annual maintenance payment, the Forestry Commission for this block of woodland, which includes this wiggly bit down here, um, the total additional contribution I'd get for this one block is £11,250. And that is calculated by the, the total annual times by the hectareage of that block. This particular field parcel, um, when moving down, uh, has a total contribution of £3,300 per hectare, and that's because it intersects the flood risk layer, which I just had on just a moment ago, uh, flood risk management. So you can see that this block has got a corner of it that intersects the flood risk management, and it's also within the nature recovery biodiversity network. So you can see the brown one here, which has given me an extra £2,800. So this block is proving quite a valuable one in the whole scheme of thing, simply because it's intersecting two of the um, additional targeting layers, additional contribution layers. Um, moving down this list, just to explain some more of them, and then we can compare these blocks for which one's actually got the most value. Um, alongside the natural colonization piece, which I've already spoke about, um, you also have a yes, no for ammonia em emissions. And the ammonia emissions um, don't necessarily give you um, an additional contribution, but they do allow you to access additional grants to just have a read of the guidance on what exactly the ammonia emissions um, allows you to uh, apply for. And we've spoken about the annual maintenance. So that is the UCO scheme in its, uh, in its essence. And hopefully that provides you with clarity on terms of each of the blocks, how much you'd get paid and what each of those payments are for. In the second section of this right-hand panel, we've, obviously part we've also partnered up with the Woodland Carbon Code. And the Woodland Carbon Code has provided us with a way of estimating and just to reiterate, it is an estimation, the 100 year forecast for carbon sequestration as a ton of CO2 equivalent. And so this block of woodland over 100 years could sequester around 1400 tons, which does equate to 1400 units. So that's the gross, um, total gross. And then the cumulative total gross is for 1699. So that is a per hectare value, and that is a total this value times by the hectareage. So this is the mark. If you're looking at, for example, Woodland Carbon Code um, uh, and looking at carbon markets, that is the value that you're going to be looking at in terms of how much could I potentially sell if that's the route you want to go. And the way that's cal calculated is still fairly crude. We are looking at ways to improve it, but we use a, a predefined list of species of beech, Scots pine silver birch and oak to um, estimate if that mix of broadleaf were planted in that block, what the equivalent carbon would be. Now, obviously you could be a bit more bespoke if you were to um, finalize that plan, but hopefully it just gives you a nice indication of roughly the ballpark we're in. And so that's kind of the attributes we've got. We've got the value in terms of the maintenance payment, we've got the value through the additional contributions, and we've got the estimated carbon value from the Woodland Carbon Code. What you can do just as a thought exercise is you can hold shift and click on multiple blocks of woodland and you can turn on the total annual payment. So you can see value, but also the total contribution in terms of the additional payment that you're going to get as well. And so what this shows is that all of these blocks are 
each worth £3,300 per hectare. So there actually isn't much difference between all of these woodland blocks. It's obviously just the hectareage that's defining the value. So if I'm choosing as a landowner, I would consider all of these to be of equal value, um, financially at least, to me. Strategically, when you're thinking about your business or your client's business, some of these blocks might be you know, less productive, for example, or a slightly trickier area that might therefore be a, a better place to plant that woodland. I'll turn off that label now. And the other thing to say is that all of that data that you've generated is available as an Excel spreadsheet as well. So if you do want to download any one of those tables, it could be all the options. You can view it in a table view that breaks down every unique polygon by field ID and breaks down all of the value that you could get for each one of those. So if you want to look at it in a spreadsheet form and see which total contributions, for example, you're intersecting across your farm, you, know, you can see some of them here are intersecting that flood risk and others aren't, et cetera, et cetera. That is available for, for downloading within here um, for e exporting to Excel. And that also contains the carbon values as well. So I've now got insight and at least where my high value sites are. I know where's eligible. I'm now going to spend five minutes just designing up a demo plan on this farm um, using the Woodland Creation template, which is that second product release we've done. The first thing we'd like people to do is obviously choose which block or blocks of land you are considering to put into UCO. So just hypothetically, I'm going to maybe just focus on this area up here and I'm going to hold shift on my keyboard and select the block or blocks that I would like to put into a woodland creation plan. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create another plan that I'm going to call UCO application. And I do that by right clicking on the polygons, hitting copy to plan and hitting create a new plan. Within here, I can give it a name, UCO application demo. And on this list, I'm looking for woodland creation template, which at the moment is at the bottom of the list because it was the most recent one we released. When I hit create new plan, what I've now done is I've just brought over the features that I previously selected. So now what I've got is I've got that cluster of wooden blocks um, that have come over to an, a new plan that I can now start to edit and amend to build up a bit of a, an idea of how this woodland planting could happen. The first thing you may want to do is you may want to allocate what type of woodland you're looking to plant in this area. And when we say type of woodland, broadly, is it a broadleaf um, mixed or is it a, a conifer woodland? And you can access that on the right hand side by um, going into the change button, going to uh, veg uh, no, sorry, woodland blocks um, and in there getting productive mixed conifer or native broadleaf or natural colonization as well. So you can choose which of those high level broad planting types you're wanting to put in and draw them on the map. That is now at least allocated each of those to a, a type of planting and you can mix them up as well. So it might be you have a, a section of uh, conifer within your broadleaf planting. Other things that you can do under UCO is you can apply for capital items. So capital items such as fencing and gates so I can see that there's a track going through here. So hypothetically, what I may want to do is put a little gate in here and just amend the shape of this woodland block to make sure it actually fits with what's happening on the ground, which is you know slightly less area for planting trees in this block than I'm currently giving um, credit to. The first thing I want to do is to put that gate in. If I select the field parcel that I want the gate to go in, hit draw, choose a point and a point feature represents any option that has a you know a per unit cost which in the sake of a gate and I drop that point on the polygon that I would like to plant. I can then also put another gate in say here which I'm going to put in another block and I'm also going to put a gate in over here. Now for those that have used land up a lot some of you may be questioning now all of these points have got the same field ID um, which all of these have got 7857, seven, but actually this block over here has got, uh, where's my field ID? Got, oh, here it is, sorry, uh, 8042. The validator is where that's going to be cleaned up in the moment. We've started to build the process to automatically assign the field IDs for you, so you don't have to worry about maintaining that yourself. So I will just keep those live to demo that in a moment. So I've drawn my points on. I can select all those points by right clicking here, select points, and I, I can now type in gate. So I'm going to give these ones a wooden field gate. And again, we've got the, the payment rate 
from the UCO application. So for a wooden field gate, it's 600 pounds, uh, 612 pounds for each of those units. Also, what I'd like to do is change the shape of this woodland block. So I'm actually going to exclude just this patch on the right hand side and maybe just ignore these buildings and make this a slightly smaller planting of woodland. And I can do that by right clicking on, on a polygon, hitting split, and then I can click once outside of the block and then keep clicking to um, kind of carve my little uh, woodland block around where I want to plant it. So this is the first crude way of doing it. I then have a block here that I want to keep and I want to delete everything that's around the outside. So I'm now basically saying that is my woodland block. You can change the shape of that woodland block by either changing the edges, you can make it slightly neater if you so wish, um, and you can buffer it, extend it, edit it however you like. I've now edited the size of that woodland block um, so it's no longer that same field parcel shape. I then want to create a line. So I want to plant a fence. Uh, I want to create a fence, for example, around here for deer. I can draw a line. The land app will automatically snap the line around the outside. Um, double click to finish. And what that then means is I have a line that I can assign to something like a fence. Ooh. Fencing. Let's go for deer fencing. Okay, so I basically draw my woodland block. I've edited the shape of it and I've drawn a fence. And then um, that's now, uh, let me move my little gate. That is now in the wrong place. Move my little gate here. So I've got a little gate to, to enter into that part. Just to reiterate that, so if I wanted to put in more fencing, um, I can click on a shape, hit draw, and draw a line. And then the default is that land that will snap to the outside of that block. So you can see that it's, it's picking up the edge of those features for me, which means that I don't have to worry about being perfectly. Uh, accurate, I've got a nice clean edge to my um, woodland block. Um, the other options that you can apply for, so you've got your capital items like fencing and, deer, um, and gates. You also can apply for things like vegetation management. So that can be a scarification for um, your natural seeding, for your natural colonization, sorry, or maybe a bit of bracken control. Now, bracken control. For example, if you're going to plant in here, it goes on top of that existing woodland planting. So I'm still wanting this polygon to be a woodland planting, but let's just say hypothetically, I also wanted to do bracken brack control in this area. The way I would do that is firstly hit this duplicate button. And what that duplicate button does is it just adds another identical polygon, just to show you another identical polygon on top of that existing one. And then secondly, I can then assign that to bracken control. I've got mechanical or I've got chemical um, or I've got follow-up treatment. But just for now, I'm going to go for mechanical bracken control. So this field is, is all woodland block, but I've got a section of it that's going into bracken control as well. And you can make these as neat as you like. You can obviously divide them into compartments. You can label them. You can do whatever you need to do um, to, to make that woodland plan correct. But at least gives you a way of doodling up and making the, the, the map visually look correct. Now, one thing to make you aware of now I've done quite a lot of editing to the shapes and the size and the location. A couple of these attributes have diverged from the truth. The value annually is going to be correct, but because this was originally calculated on the per hectare value, um, this total contribution is now off. We've now reduced the size of this polygon, which means the total hectare hectare has reduced. And the same with the carbon as well. So the carbon, although the, the per hectare value is correct, the total um, has uh, not reduced. So what we need to do is we need to validate this plan. We need to double check that I haven't made any mistakes. Um, and we also need to double check that the numbers are correct. One obvious mistake that I'm just going to make, just so you can see the process, is if I was hypothetic hypothetically made my fence go out like that and also made my woodland block go out like this, so I've accidentally dragged it, the validator will clean that up for me as well. So if you've made any mistakes because you've accidentally dragged an area outside of your ownership or you've dragged an area outside over onto some constraints, the validator should clean that bit up for me as well. OK, so I'm now happy with my plan. Um, roughly, obviously not as neat as it was earlier, but I want to demonstrate the point. I can now do that third tool. So after Woodland Creation, the validator tool, it's accessible within the three dots along the name Yuko, and it's within this new button that we released only a couple of weeks called Toolbox. When you click on Toolbox, 
it will load a list of tools available for that plan type. So only when you use the Woodland Creation template will you see the UCO Validator tool. If you're opening up, say, a countryside stewardship, you will only see the Geometry Fixer tool. We are looking to introduce a validator for stewardship and SFI to do watch this space. But to run the UK validator, hopefully it's fairly straightforward, is you hit UK validator and then you, it just asks you, are you sure you want to run that validator, validator against the application demo? I hit run. And what that's going to do is it's just going to rerun this new woodland plan. So it's got my focus areas only and it's got some capital items on and it's going to return for me Again, the updated calculations, but it will also identify where I've got invalid areas as well, which is really critical to make sure those applications are still correct. You're still mapping within the, the correct constraints. While we wait for this to run, I can see there's quite a few questions coming through, but if there's any other questions you've got, please do let me know. And again, an email will come through once it is ready. So there we are. So what's happened now is the land app validator has happened. I've now received an extra two layers from land app. One's called valid and one's called invalid. And what we've done is we've flagged for you the areas of your plan that since drawing you've made invalid for whatever reason, it might be uh, just an, uh, a bit of geometry error or you've accidentally drawn a line over the, over the top. And so these two red features are excluded because they're both outside of my SBI number. I've tried to I've tried to apply for UCO outside of areas that are eligible. So these two in particular are outside SBI. If I were to, for example, spill over onto a scheduled monument or a bit of peat, it would again return to me those areas of error, but it would tell me that they were on a, a designation or a scheduled monument, et cetera. So these invalid areas, you can leave here if you want, or you can obviously just delete that plan. But the valid plan has now basically just reserved me a clean version of my original plan, removing the areas of invalid, invalid areas. The other thing that that process does is it also should have reallocated my field numbers. So for example, this point was parcel ID 7854, and hopefully now this one has got an updated parcel ID to better reflect that particular feature. So although on that original plan, these will all have the same parcel ID of 7854, the validator has reallocated the correct field IDs for me as well. So now I can now I'm you know rest assured that when I go to apply for my UCO application, that the 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 capital items are assigned to the correct field IDs and the correct compartments as well. Um so that's kind of the validator. And the final thing I want to show you now before we have a quick conversation with Chris is I want to just show you the emails that were sent to me um, as part of that process. Um, let me just open that up and bring this across. Um, let me just find that. So the first email that I get, uh, where is it? This one, data summary, you receive from Land App and um, from Land App and the Forestry Commission, a full email from that initial request of your total area that's eligible within UCO, um, and also which field IDs are most valuable according to this system as well. So this email, please give it a read when you receive it. It includes the you know a couple of caveats that the tool you know just can't be used for. It gives you that estimated carbon sequestration, and it also gives you some contact details around the woodland carbon code your potential eligibility, et cetera, et cetera. So when you do run it, do have a quick read of that because it one gives you the values and quite a nice high level summary of the values, but it also then gives you some of those um, caveats that you need to just be considering when you're building your plan. The other thing to show you and just to bring it up across is then I get it, I've received a second email that's my UCO validator request, which is exactly the same structure, but this one is now just showing me values that my validated plan has. So it's recalculated all those areas. So in my plan, I'm now going from 30 hectares or so of eligible woodland to 5.11 uh, hectares that I'm looking to put in my plan. And again, recalculates all of those estimations, um, how much I'm gonna get. So for my five hectares that I've just designed with you, I'm gonna get an annual maintenance of 1600 pounds. 
and a total one-off supplementary payment of £15,000 to put the trees in the ground. Um, and again, the email is exactly the same structure. So have, have a read, but if you've read it once, um, yeah, there's some more information in it again. Okay, so that's building my plan. And then the final step, just to show you, um, you can obviously export those plans as well. So I'm just going to come back to land app. Is now I've got a um, a, a breakdown of my uh, UCO plan that I can access through the reports page. So you hit the reports button, hit add plan, and look at my valid UCO application. This is now a breakdown of what I'm actually applying for. So I'm looking as part of my application to get three wooden field gates, um, 1,000 meters of deer fencing, um, 0.42 hectares of bracken control, and then this is the ratio of my native broadleaf to mixed conifer planting as well. So that's a bit of a schedule of what we're looking to create under UCO. And then as part of that application, what you will need is this annex form or this uh, this spreadsheet, which has a slightly more detailed breakdown of the features you're creating, um, what it looks like um, and how much you're going to get paid under the scheme. As part of that application, as mentioned, we're looking for in, to introduce a button somewhere that will send you a pre-populated annex form. At the moment, you will just need to use this download. But also as part of your scheme, you will need to print off a clean map to represent where that forestry planting is happening. Um, and you can do that again using the land app print function. I'm just going to turn on some labels um, so we can at least see what we're planting and where. I'm going to turn on uh, some labels for my fencing, like so, uh, deer fencing, etc. And I'm just going to quickly, in 30 seconds, print off a map. If you want to have a step-by-step -step guide of how to print, there's lots of guidance on our YouTube channel, but I'm gonna hit new frame. Uh, I'm gonna turn that to uh, portrait. I'm gonna just zoom in and make a, a nice layer, customize my print, add a legend, which then has everything I want. I'm gonna go to standard and grayscale. I'm gonna give it a header and call it Yuko application. Like so, I can add a new logo if I want. I can add a little footer here and say demo. And then I'm happy with that map. It's got all I need. The legends will format it for me to identify the location of the planting and the capital items, etc. I can then either preview or hit buy now. And that data is then available to download as a PDF or a PNG ready for your application as well. So it's very quick. Once you've got the plan, you also have the right evidence to submit the Forestry Commission as part of that planting plan. OK, I think it's time two minutes early to um, bring on Chris Waterfield from the uh, Forestry Commission. Um, Chris has uh, been pivotal in us getting to this point. Um, so, Chris, delighted to have you here. Um, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, the, the project wouldn't have got to where it is without you. So we're very grateful for your support. Um, I think the first thing I wanted to ask you really is what, what are you looking to get out of this partnership with the Land App? Well, to be honest, Dan, what we want is to get UCO more coverage. And this gets UCO more coverage. And it gets UCO into a good place um, for agents, landowners, um, to be able to actually make their own application and draw, as you've demonstrated, draw in a whole load of different things that um, other apps and other things don't do and can't do for you. So it's, it, it's, it's in the main, it's about getting UCO more exposure um, and therefore getting more people to apply for the grant. But with this, we get more accurate ac um, calculations, we get more accurate maps and, and things are generally smoother. Now, I'm not saying that that is going to mean that you will go through the UCO process with a like a um, like a dose of salts, but you will um, have a better map and you will have a better understanding of what you are in, what you can apply for. Uh, and personally, well, um, my role as um, carbon and water advisor, um, this gets people exposure also to um, the Woodland Carbon Code and calculations from um, from this can be used as an estimate to to give you the, an idea about what you might or may not be able to um, to get out of a, an application to the Wooden Carbon Code. 
Yeah, really great. And I think we're very aligned there. We're not, we're not trying to replace the need for a survey. What we're trying to do is grease the wheels and get more people understanding the process, get edu educated about the scheme, better understand their farm, but also understand the hidden potential as well. Because even me personally, I didn't quite know about the Woodland Carbon Code as much as I've learned through this process. And I think understanding potential, whether or not you go and sell the carbon is a, a different story, but just understanding you know, the, the more hidden value of the woodland planting as well is quite important. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, and 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 actually, um, in a lot of circumstances now, we're finding that people who are planting on farms are actually thinking about woodland carbon for their own use, not necessarily for selling, but for their own use in offsetting um, carbon activity or carbon emissions on their farm over a, um, a long period of time. So in, in, in a double way, it can be useful for getting more income in, but also for helping you to um, to offset your own emissions. Yeah, what, one of the things that strikes me about UCO is it's a very innovative way of dealing with public funding. Um, do you think it's going to be a bit of an example for wider use in ELMS? I just like the idea of there's a base rate for the thing and then incentivizing the right thing in the right place. Sure. It's surely got a lot of wider applications. So I just wonder where that idea came from and whether you see well, it I being think, a study. Yeah, I mean, we, um, it, UCO, I think, is a bit of a trial for for um, ELM. The um, the way that we are paying for public benefits um, or providing you a uh, providing a, a, a landowner with um, a payment for a proxy of the benefit. In fact, we're not paying um, in 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 UCO. It's a um, it's a contribution towards a benefit, but uh, and and it's a benefit or, or a, a um, a contribution that um, is because you've put the woodland in the right place. What we're not saying is that it's a proxy for the unit, um, whatever that might be. Um, it is a it, it's an approximation to um, to what to what we think is is available. Um, and in in due course and over over time, I see, yeah, we will slide into the back of. Um, of ELM um, and uh, hopefully um, UCO will remain as um, the brand and the rates and the payments will be the same for woodland creation in under the ELM um, banner uh, and, and over time obviously as markets expand for ecosystem services some of those um, contributions that we make will be replaced by private payments yeah and i think you know that that's exactly where we see the value is that over time those additional contributions could come from another source yeah you know, absolutely. You're, you're the, the woodland going next to the water course that's got flood mitigation and water quality benefit there's other people other operators in that area that surely they would like to are. So we, we too see the value in that and we're, you know, we're very excited about the potential of this structure and I think looking forward to seeing where the partnership goes. Chris, yeah. thank you so much for your time. We've got no 10 minutes left. If you're happy to hang around, there's going to be yeah, a couple I'm of good. questions that are coming through the chat, which I will field to you as well. Um, but thank you very much for giving that overview. No problem at all. Um, so we're just going to work down the list. There's been quite a few questions coming in. So question from Anon, is existing woodland cover also in a, a constraint for UCO? Yes, hopefully that was demonstrated. If your land is already registered it, with the RPA as being woodland, we include that as a constraint. The obvious caveat is if it's not registered as woodland with the Rural Payments Agency, it will be served as not a constraint. You just need to make sure that your RNE1 forms are up to date with the, forestry, uh, with the Rural Payments Agency. Um, or obviously just make sure you're adapting your plan accordingly. A question from Luke. I wonder if it'd be possible to have an option not to split parcels when checking UCO eligibility or only to split, split, uh, split bits of the parcel which aren't eligible. Um, so yeah, Luke, really good question. Um, technically, it's quite difficult because certain parts of the field are eligible for things that other parts of the field aren't, natural colonization being one. Um, you can manually merge things together by using the merge function, which I, I think you, you're familiar with. But yeah, the, when you run the validator, it's still gonna fragment them out simply because there might be a change in payment rate or change in constraint. So that's something that you will just have to manually merge together as and when you can. And I can't think technically, particularly if there's variation in those rates, um, I can't quite see how else we'd do it, I'm afraid. 
Um, Chris, question for you. Could you please just clarify the annual payments? Is it a maximum of £350 per year per hectare or are there additional annual payments? Um, the payment for woodland creation, woodland management, woodland establishment is £350 per hectare per year for 15 years. Um, there's no extra on top of that for woodland, uh, for managing the woodland. That's the fixed rate for, for the process. The, the, the chain or, or the, the difference in rates maybe comes in the additional contributions, which are paid at the beginning of, or rather at the end of your capital implementation. So when you've put the last um, tree in the ground or, uh, or, or however you're, you've organized it, um, that's when your additional contributions are made, and that is, and the, the additional contributions are variable with um, with the land parcel, depending on right. um, depending on their eligibility. Great, right, thank you, Rachel. Hopefully that answered your question. The question from Mark again for Chris: what, Why is Grade Two excluded? We have a number of sch schemes already on this grade. Um, Mark, I I had a. Uh, an inkling that somebody might uh, ask this question. Um, it's it's not that we don't allow it. Um, it's that there's there are or would be an awful lot of people saying you you might not want to be doing that because it's it's the best and most versatile land. Now, obviously, that decision is entirely up to the landowner is that they want to continue with a pro with with a woodland creation project on on grade one or two land. But for the purposes of this app, we decided that it was um, it it was more genuine for us to for us as a um, as an agency to say. Um, that we'd exclude that land it's not that you can't do it mark at all it is that um it is more difficult to do it on that land okay so it's the the advisory really uh, but yeah. yeah for the for the process and scalability through the app it made sense to exclude for now and yeah. let's see how the targets go over the next couple of months but Absolutely. that's actually quite quite good to hear that if you are on grade two you know don't don't feel like that's a blocker particularly if you're looking at maybe you know, corridors of woodland rather than whole whole fields going into it it, it still is an option um but yeah we're obviously trying to promote food production at the same time here um so a question from rob um if you don't own the land and therefore don't have an sbi number but you're considering a purchase is it possible um so rob no not at the moment we built it so you acquire an sbi number simply because we're trying to in engage those that have management rights over that land at the moment plus the SBI number gives us the land cover data, which we wouldn't have without. So there's two reasons we need the SBI number, one a more practical one, um, but it is something we're looking at, um, whether we can at least model hypothetically bounding boxes of land, um, but watch this space, not present at the moment. Anon, if a field parcel is adjacent to a deciduous woodland layer on the priority habitat, would this flag up as a constraint? Surely expand, expanding existing woodland would be encouraged so as long as the other constraints weren't flagged. Yep, so that's a, it's a good point. So if you've got a deciduous woodland, the woodland itself is a hard constraint, but you will still be able to plant woodland adjacent to it. So that wouldn't be excluded from your map. It would just be included as a woodland constraint for that particular area. But of course, we'd love to encourage more woodland to be connecting up with existing and hence why that natural colonization process of within 75 meters is there as well. Um, a question for Chris from Darren. Is there any plans to include the effects of coppice management in any of the plantations? Um, depends what you're wh where you're getting at. If you're looking at it for from a woodland carbon co point of view, um, coppice management can be included. It's 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 not a diff it's not a um, it's not an easy pro um, process, but you can include coppice management in um, a woodland carbon code application. Um, coppice management in terms of um, creating new woodland. Um, well, coppice management is is something that we would want to encourage, and um, you would have to plant the species that would um, that would naturally coppice um, into your woodland. Um, I hope that's answering the question. I'm not really sure, though. Yeah, I, I think it has. In my in my head, coppice management is less around woodland creation and more about woodland management. But I guess it's like 
yeah I mean, so i think i guess in terms of the woodland carbon code you can include that you would include it as a very short um rotational felling system okay. as far as the code as far as the woodland carbon code is concerned perfect darren's given us a thumbs up all good i think we answered this question thanks good Okay, so a quick question from Mark. Uh, Mark, can you show how you opened the template for the UCO application? Um, yeah, just to show you back on Land App. Um, here's the print that's completed, by the way. So you can download it as a PDF. Um, so if I went back to my map, just to show you again, the main the main place that I would go is have my valid plan turned on at the top right hand side. Bearing in mind my head on Zoom might be over it, and so might Chris's. So you might need to drag my camera out the way there's a little button called reports if you click on that what that will do is allow you to add a plan and choose your valid plan and that gives you a breakdown of all the different features that you drew on your map which is kind of a bit of a i guess a, a register so to speak and if you need a more detailed breakdown of what that looks like you can basically click the little table view button there and that opens up a, a, a more genuine report based on the field ids and each individual feature depending on which one you need, Mark. Um, are payments recalculated following the creation of a plan, e.g. a conifer or mixed schemes are unlikely to meet requirements of biodiversity payment? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, Chris, are the, if you're applying for conifer or broadleaf planting, does that impact any of the additional contributions such as biodiversity payments? It, well, it does, in, it, it does, and there are um, design constraints and design guidelines in the UCO manual that say um, what species you should plant in order to um, qualify for the um, the various and and what density you should plant them at but, uh, for the various different contributions themselves. Um, I would imagine that. Um, the way that UCO has been constructed, um, if you if you increase the amount of conifer that you might have in a in a woodland, um, and you're trying to claim the biodiversity high high biodiversity um, additional contribution, that might need to be recalculated for you. Okay, interesting. So maybe we can pick that up off our offline, Chris. But sure. dur during the validate process, we could technically, if they've said they're going to do a conifer plantation we could remove the biodiversity payment from that so maybe there's some things we can tweak but yeah. at the moment the tool is very much there to market the scheme get you ready to understand Absolutely. potential you're still going to have to go through the regular channels to get that actually agreed and signed off so um they will hopefully yeah, be Dan, out then. i mean as we as, as we've said um before i think we see this as a as the beginning of a process beginning of a partnership so you know these things um we will we will look to um in the future yeah, I completely agree. And I think there's loads of potential we could go down. But yeah, I think that's a really yeah. good avenue that we could explore. Um, so a question from Chris. Uh, if an area is mapped as priority habitat and initially excluded by the tool for UCO, is there an option to override the tool to include that parcel as part of the UCO summary or application? For example, if the land has been incorrectly mapped or is out of date on the priority habitat layer and it's been agreed. Yeah, a really good point, Chris. So our validator and checker relies on natural England's data or the data we're running as constraints to be up to date. So you as a human have final say, I can still, if, if I ran the validator right, as I've done, and I know that this block was eligible, you can still manually override that and bring that out as a, as a shape, ready for your application. It's just that that system is just telling you the computer thinks it's not eligible, but you can still manually override that when you're filling in your annex form and actually applying for UCO. Um, yeah, we want to keep Priority Habitat up to date as much as we can. And Land Up has got a live connection. So if, as soon as the Natural England updates it, it should automatically be part of that process already. Um, Tom says, can you apply for these options on land already in mid-tier? Chris, one for you. Already in a countryside stewardship application, do they co-locate? I imagine not. Um, it's normally best on, on, the, um, on the lower um, lower tiers, but I if it's already in a in a mid tier scheme, it's probably still got a valid scheme on it. Um, and you'd be waiting till a break point um, in your contract before you could renegotiate. Um, but that's a question that you would have to take to your woodland officer and um, the uh, Natural England um, advisor to actually discuss with them. 
it's not impossible. Mm. It's just it is it is just that there's more of a process. Great, thank you, Chris. I'm glad I had you here for these Q and A's because I don't think I could answer many of these. Um, another question from Mark: um, What about tenant SBI numbers, which are coming back into the landowners? They want to be able to design with these again. The, the Mark same same point applies. You still need will act, you still would need access to the correct SBI number. If the tenant's happy to provide them to the landowner, um, that's great. But at the moment, you need the SBI number to run them. Um, just technically. Um, would you need to manually re-add the fencing that's missing after the validator runs? Oh yeah, well spotted, Anon. Yeah, so on my map here, yeah, it, the, the validator, because I did something silly, which was through a fence like this, it removed the ineligible bit. So I will need to manually add um, uh, the fence from here to here. Well done. Yes, that's definitely something that the validator got rid of and didn't replace just because it wouldn't know, like so. Yeah. Um, Sicily, hello, thank you for joining. Um, how would you recommend dealing with unmapped white space where an RNE1 has been submitted? Wait for the parcel to be mapped by the RPA and refresh the download data, or can you add it in the land cover layer to help with validation? Yeah, really good question, Sicily. Um, so you would have to wait for the RPA really to use the tool properly. Obviously, you can still use the woodland creation template and map your own things, but for the validator and the checker, it relies on the SBI number being correct. So that is maybe a bit of a weakness and particularly for yourself um, at National Trust, we maybe just need to have a secondary conversation around that process um, because obviously there's slightly different terms with National Trust to everyone else um, in terms of the RPA data. Um, question from Martin Steer. Um, just a note, we've overrun. Um, as a, It's great there's still 100 people are on here, so I'm happy to stay for five minutes if Chris, are, Chris is. Um, if you do need to leave, thank you so much for your time. Just reminder, please answer that survey when you leave. It will just help myself and Chris and others plan this partnership as we move forward. Question from Martin Steer. Um, note that after a validator was run, it chopped out the part deer fencing. Oh, yeah, we've done that one. Sorry. Um, yeah, just well spotted Martin as well. Um, question from Anon. Can you add OS grid lines onto the mapping? I think FC require this or will the parcel references suffice? So we do actually have grid lines, but I don't know how detailed they go. If you type in grid, OS grid reference. But yeah, I think it's quite um, broad. It's not um, one more level down. I suppose, Chris, the question to you is, is, an, is enough of information, the national grid reference associated to each of those features? Or do you need on the map a um, the grid lines as well that show the grid references? Um, I think if... Uh... If we have a detailed grid reference, then that will suffice and parcel data that will suffice. Remembering this is um, your your first go um, at, at providing the map um, and over time that might change. Um, but as far as I know, um, a good map reference like that one that's been provided there of uh, eight figures is um, is sufficient for us to locate the scheme. Yeah, great. Yeah, this so automatically by default, all of them will have a national grid field number, which is using the structure that they are of the RLR. And then what manually users can add a grid reference if they want. Now, if we need to tighten that up, we can work out a way of automatically doing that for users. But users can access grid references very easily by clicking on the polygon and going to the coordinates button at the bottom right. And that will load your what three words, your latitude longed, your grid reference for that particular feature. If, if you need to access them for whatever reason. Um, great, uh, a question from Luke. At some point we need open ground and species info. Will the checker include areas of open ground in the additional contributions and check if we have the right percentage ages for eligibility by compartment or overall? Yeah, Luke, what you've answered there is probably the next phase of what we're looking at. At the, at the moment, we're very much keeping it slightly higher level than that although we are going to consider how do we improve the tool for, I guess, a more detailed woodland planting plan, which will include species mix, include your open space, and we'll hope the tool will then help the eligibility. But for now, it doesn't do that. Um, you're, that's still a manual process that you can fill out in the annex form. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Chris. Oh, nope. um, Katie says, are the maps free to download? So just a very quick point, you can download free maps if you use the OpenStreetMap base map. So there is free printing if you use OpenStreetMap. I don't know if Forestry Commission have a 
requirement for OS data to be used. I think providing it's an indication of the location, I think they'll be happy. And, um, but yeah, if you use OpenStreetMap, you don't have to pay. Um, all the other ones, there is a there is a fee associated to them. Oh, it says I've got no internet. Um, but yeah, I I use OS Lite because it's the cleanest and it looks it looks the smartest and it's obviously the authoritative one as well. Um, probably a question for uh, Chris. Chris, what's the tax situation for creating woodland via Yuko on an agricultural land? Um, I, I think you'd have to ask um, ask a tax tax specialist. I'm not a tax specialist. Um, what the only thing I do know is that um, once created, woodland um, working woodland is um, treated as um, uh, exempt from income tax, I believe. But I would I, I would absolutely check with um, a tax specialist on that. Okay, let's go for seek advice on that comment. Um, I think that's the best way of doing it. We've still got probably 20 questions in, which is amazing engagement. We'll probably spend another five minutes going through these, but we will answer the rest via email and release an FAQ page to everyone. And just, we won't be able to get through them all. So another couple of moments just to answer some more and then we'll call it a day. Um, so a question from Stan, is the Wooden Carbon Code available separately to the UCO Checker tool? I'm interested in terms of coverage for the developed, devolved nations Related to this, are there any plans to work with Scottish Forestry, Natural Resources Wales to cover forestry grants? Um, so I can answer half of that, Stan. So at the moment, the Woodland Carbon Code is only contained within this workflow for UCO. However, the Forestry Commission have released a tool called the ESC tool, uh, Environmental Site Classification Tool. The question is, Chris, Chris, does that also work in Scotland and Wales? I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know either. I think it does actually, because it was developed by Forest Research as a national UK national tool, and it was developed before devolved um, before we devolved. So ESC should work, um, and obviously the Woodland Carbon Code is available across the whole of the UK. Okay, perfect. So what I'll do is in the follow up email with Kathy, we will just add a link to the ESC tool for for Stan for you to be able to run the carbon estimations in Scotland and uh, in Wales as well. And we are speaking to Natural Resources Wales and a bit of Scotland at the moment, but they're being it's a lot more tricky than it has been to work with the Forestry Commission England and the Rural Payments Agency. So watch this space, but very much our priority at the moment, at least in this uh, scheme, is is England. Um. Vincent, um, I've already had my woodland creation woods accepted. I don't want to confuse the Forestry Commission by sending them emails, etc. Can I map my new woods onto Land App without sending emails, or does it not matter? So yeah, Vincent, I think just to confirm, everything you do on Land App is private to yourself. The Forestry Commission will not see anything you're mapping on the Land App unless you choose to share it with them. So I would say, if you've already got your plans accepted, great. Uh, just continue with that. Transferring the maps onto Land App won't notify the Forestry Commission at all. They will just remain in isolation and be a place for you to have your records. Um, question from Kinna. It would be amazing if it could be used for ELM in the future. Uh, thank you. Yep, we're going to look at local nature recovery strategies and ELMs and how this type of mechanism could potentially under, underpin things like Countryside Stewardship Plus, et cetera, to incentivize the right option in the right place. Um, and this is very much a, a test for, for many of the um, gov agencies, I believe. Um, okay, at 10 past, I'm going to put one more question to uh, Chris. Um, at the end of 15 years, is the only constraint the need to apply for a felling license? So after the 15 years happens, is the only, I suppose, next step felling license constraints? On the creative woodland, um, the constraint to um, it is is that it is already um, because you will have changed the land use to woodland. Um, so the constraint is that you will keep it as woodland once it has been made into woodland. Um, so yes, you need to get a felling license if it's a fellow if it's of licensable size. Um, but uh, you would need to also make sure that um, you weren't in breach of any. Um, regulations if you decided you didn't want to keep the woodland you might end up paying some money back but who knows okay great thanks there's actually one more question i've just seen i'd love to ask as a final question is 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 there 
um, scope or is the Forestry Commission considering agroforestry as part of the UCO pipe scheme? As as part of UCO, no, but as part of ELM, yes. Great. Okay. Fabulous. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for your time. It's great. There's still 75 of you still on the call, which is, is an amazing turnout. So I really appreciate all your questions. Um, we're going to call it a day now. Um, we will get over some answers to the questions that have been unanswered through an FAQs page that we'll put on our website over the next week or two. And we will be sharing that round with all the people that registered for the webinar. Um, just Final point is thanks, Chris, for your time. Thank you for your patience over the last 12 months in getting to this point. And let's hopefully see more applications of the UK scheme come through soon. Yeah, mate. Have a good day, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.